great to be with you today. And let me add my welcome to those you've already received. Um, It's an exciting time in the life of our church. And uh, if we haven't yet met, I'm Stephen and really looking forward to getting to know you, hearing a bit of your story and connecting in. And uh, I want to speak today on this passage and how we might cultivate our potential, cultivate our potential. And I love this passage. This passage has spoken into my life um, at loads of different points and with real precision. And it surprised me actually the way it has spoken into my life at different points. And I'm convinced that God has a word for each of us today through this passage. And because you have within you the seed of the word of God. There is a seed of huge potential inside you. So how do we maximize the potential of that seed? And Jesus says it's so important to listen, uh, to take heed, to hear, and how you listen and who you listen to are two of the most important things about you. How you listen determine what grows within you. And you know, if you truly listen, it means you haven't just forgotten something, it takes root in you, it shifts your perspective, it provokes you to action, it actually changes things in your life. But who do you listen to? And there are so many voices, so many influences, so many talking heads in the media, so many people, so much information out there. Because if who you, how you listen determines what grows in you, who you listen to determines who you become. And if you want to cultivate your potential, We have to listen to Jesus' words to us in such a way that they take root in our hearts, they shift the perspective of our minds, and they actually bear fruit in our lives. And that's a huge challenge, but also a huge opportunity today. And the first thing we see in this passage that Jesus um, encourages us to do is to keep your heart soft. Keep your heart soft. And... um, Jesus says, some seed fell on the path, it was trampled on, and the birds ate it up, and it wasn't received into the soil because the soil was hard. So the story Jesus tells is about um, someone sowing their seed, a farmer in the Middle East, and uh, lots of you will know that in that time, uh, there weren't clearly marked out fields with walls and fences and hedges, there'd just be paths around the edge of the field that people would sow. And so people would walk along these paths and they'd press down, obviously, the earth and it would become harder and harder and harder. But the sower, in order to sow, and um, I actually know some of you are farmers, but um, the sower, in order to sow, has to scatter the seed. You know, you can't just kind of gently place one bit down, gently place another bit down. You want to get an even kind of like that, and you're, oh, so sorry, and an even kind of, um, you're just, you just got to say it quite like that, and that, that helps it get, and, but, but that means you can't be unduly precise about where you're putting it. You want to get an even, nice uh, scattering of seed, and that means some of the seed is going to fall on the paths at the edge of the field. It's not just going to be scattered in one place. And so normally you'd scatter the seed, then you'd plow the ground, but some inevitably would go on the hard ground. And the seed sown on that hard ground has no chance at all of breaking through the surface. It just sits there, and then um, eventually um, some birds would fly in. I don't have any here today, but some birds would fly in and uh, eat it up and scatter it away. And um, Jesus says the seed is the word of God. It's the good news about Jesus. We've been hearing from Kitty about the good news of Jesus, who he is and what he's done. And Jesus says some people are like the path. Though the word is sown towards them, it lands on them, but it doesn't actually get into them. And before it has any chance to take root, because of the the hardness, uh, the devil comes and snatches away. It doesn't get into people's hearts because their hearts are hard. And I wonder today, if you were being honest, if you've ever had that experience of having a hard heart. And maybe you know how it feels even to have a hard heart. Because sometimes it's just the busyness of life. It's so intense. It's so busy. You're trying to work out so many things. You're racing through life. Just kind of get through the day. You know, it's one of those seasons in your life maybe where the... Um, The days are long, but the years are short, and it just feels like you're racing, 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 and you don't even have the time to think about the Word of God. You don't have the time to think about what Jesus is saying. At other times, it's because someone has upset you or offended you, and you would never say it maybe, but you're aware that actually your heart has hardened a little bit towards them. It's like you've almost closed off 
a bit of your heart to that person. And there might not be any relational, uh, any spatial distance between you. You could be still be in the same room as them, but there's a relational distance for you. You're not open to that somewhere because your heart is hard because you've been offended or upset by someone. It might be a friend or a colleague or a boss. And, uh, and, and so you're just slightly closing yourself off to that person. And, and the thing is, you can't harden your heart in one area without it impacting every other area. And sometimes our hearts just become quite hard. And uh, sometimes it's pride. And I've had that experience. I mean, you, you kind of feel like, oh, why do I have to listen to God? You know, blah, 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 all this, all that. The Bible, you know. And you can go through seasons when you're like, well, I just can't, I can't be bothered. And you feel like, well, I don't really need that help. Um, when I was studying, I still remember, I was just, I just thought I was just going to do my own thing. You know, I'll pay attention to God, but I'm going to do my own thing. And I was doing my own thing, going out quite a lot, clubbing quite a lot, bars, all those kind of things. And um, someone really kind at the church uh, came up to me and they said, oh, Steve, hi, um, you know, just wanted to check you're okay. And I was like, why? And um, he's like, well, you know, um, uh, just, I just noticed that you've, um, you, you, you haven't been coming to church much and you've been going to bars quite a lot. And I was like, well, how have you noticed that? And, and uh, he said, well, I didn't notice it, but someone else said. And I said, who? And, um, and he was like, oh, well, you know, just someone was talking about it. And I said, but you're a Christian. He's like, yeah, and you go to church. And I said, yeah. And he's like, so you know not to gossip then? And um, he's like, and I was like, oh, uh, so if that's okay, we're good? You know, and I was just too hard. He was trying really nicely to reach out to me and say, look, are you sure you've got stuff in the right priorities in the right order? And I was just like, you know, back off, I'm not interested. And my heart had become really hard without me realizing it over a period of six months. And because my heart was hard, it was really hard for anyone even to help me with the word of God. I wasn't interested. And the only thing that saved me was my friend Susie from uh, where I grew up. We grew up on the edge of this um, council estate. And she was taking a whole group of young guys from outside the church, um, from really difficult backgrounds, away to this uh, summer festival. And she said, I need your help to come. I was like, I don't want to do that. It's going to be miserable. Like, not what I planned for my summer. She said, come. So I came, and my heart was hard, I wasn't, and it was annoying because the kids were really annoying. Um, and they were like, uh, one of them brought a baseball bat. I was like, why did you bring a baseball bat to a Christian summer festival? That's not what you do. And then uh, they were like running around this campsite until 3 a.m. I was like, I, I go to 3 a.m. on my terms, not because you're running around the campsite, finding that really frustrating. And then also because they were interested Lots of them weren't Christians. They're interested. There were lots of Christians in one place. They were like, let's test the Christians. So they would like try and test the Christians about how godly they were. So one of them, in the middle of a field, just got down on his hands and knees and just started like tapping the earth like this. And um, these lovely Christians came along and they said, you okay? He said, I've lost my contact lens. And he didn't wear contacts. And they got down next to him and they were like, oh, let's help you. And they were all kind of like CSI searching through his field. And other Christians, because, you know, at a Christian conference festival, you have to look like you're a Christian. They're going, are you okay? They're, yeah, we're looking for this young lad's contact lens. Oh, we'll help. So there was like, after about 10 minutes, there were 50 people searching this field for a contact lens which didn't exist. And he just got up and kind of walked away. And let, they never knew. <laughs> this was just going on day after day after day. It's like, this is a nightmare. After about three days, I was like, I can't do this anymore. And then I was... We were worshiping, and I felt the Holy Spirit just start to water my heart, my hard heart. And I suddenly felt this new love rise up within me, this new love for Jesus and this new love for all these kind of slightly nightmarish young people. And I, I just softened. And within about 24 hours, my heart went from being really hard to really soft. And I got home, and for the first time in months, I thought... I really want to read the Bible. Went out and got a new Bible. Just to, I want a new one. And I started reading like the Gospels. And I was like, every day from that point on, I was like, I want to read the Bible. I don't want to miss anything that God might speak to me through his word. I'd gone from having a really hard heart in which there was no hope of the word of God landing through the Holy Spirit just kind of softening my heart and suddenly feeling much more kindness and love to other people and desperate to hear his word. One of the things the Holy Spirit does is soften our hearts so that we can hear God's word. Keep your heart soft. And then the second thing we see in this passage is grow deep roots. Grow deep roots. Um, some of the seed, uh, Jesus says, those which uh, fell on rocky ground are the ones who received 
the word with joy. But then, then the testing comes and they fall away. And some of the seed falls on rocky soil. And what that looks like, because, you know, as you know, the farmer is going out and scattering his seed and um, all over the place. And some of it falls on soil, which looks like good soil. Looks like good soil. But in the Middle East, you have some areas of soil that look like they're good soil. But actually, about this far beneath the ground, there's a layer of limestone rock. And uh, what that means is that the, 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 the seed will go in, it will be well planted, it will start to grow, but the roots can't actually grow because of the layer of limestone rock. And so what happens is there's actually very, very fast growth upwards, but very, very little growth downwards. And so it looks like the plant is flourishing, it looks like it's all going really well, but all the growth is above the surface. There's no growth under the surface, there's no root And Jesus says, people who hear the word at once and receive it with joy, but they have no root. In the time of testing, they fall away. And that is one of the most heartbreaking things to see. There's so much joy, so much enthusiasm, but then opposition comes, difficulties come, challenges come, and you fall away. And sometimes that's really direct. I don't know if you've experienced this in your own life. Uh, Maybe your friends or your family or your colleagues don't like the change that they see in you as you start to follow Jesus more closely. And it, it, it gets a bit choppy and it gets a bit difficult and it's a bit harder than you thought it might be. And the opposition you face unsettles you and you can kind of think, maybe it'd just be easier if I just back away. And maybe you've felt that even in the last 18 months. And then sometimes it's indirect, like a relationship ends unexpectedly or you hit a difficult issue at work or someone criticizes you and it it feels like you're a bit exposed and suddenly you don't feel like singing the songs we sing and your Bible just gets a bit dusty and your life gets a bit busy with other things. It's really easy to just drift away. But the truth is, Jesus says, when testing comes, when testing comes. It will come. There's no such thing, as you know, there's no such thing as an easy life, particularly if you want to make a difference. And in some ways, when you place your trust in Jesus, when you make a decision to follow him wholeheartedly, actually sometimes when you follow the call that's on his life, on your life, in your workplace, in your home, in your family, Then you're stepping onto the field of play in a new way. And sometimes it can feel like the enemy is trying to take you out. And when testing comes, it will either undermine your faith or it will refine it. And the difference is how resilient your faith is. And resilience isn't a question of how strong you look, but how deep your roots go. Um, The word comes from, it means to spring back, to absorb the pressure that's being pushed against you and be able to spring back. And and trees that can do that in a storm are those which have really deep roots. They keep you steady in the storms of life. They enable you to draw on wells of living water when you feel like you're in a desert. Storms reveal the strength of your roots. And we've all been through a bit of a storm the last 18 months, and I don't know how you found that. Some of us were probably quite surprised. We're like, actually, we've held up okay. We're all still alive. It's okay. You know, actually, our faith is all right. We feel like we're in an okay place. Some of us maybe got a bit of a shock. We're like, I thought my faith was in a good place, but I've been really challenged this last 18 months. And I feel like in this new season, I need to put some new roots down. It's, um, it's a time to, to kind of almost check how are our roots? What do we need to invest in beneath the surface because it's not as Jesus says here it's not how you start it's how you finish it's not how you start well but how things end up after a while that's what really makes the difference Beth and I got engaged um, and we were quite young I was 22 and Beth was 20 and I'll be honest you know sometimes younger people say to me now how do you know that you wanted to get engaged. I was like, I don't know, it just seemed like a good idea at the time. Like, I didn't write down some kind of long list of pros and cons. We didn't think too much about it. We just thought, let's get engaged. It seemed like fun. You know, one one Saturday afternoon, I was playing football, and then like an hour later, I was like on my knees in my football kit proposing. I hadn't really thought it through. And um, we had no idea what we were letting ourselves in for, really. And we decided, you know, why don't we get married in four months? Like, that's really soon. And why hang around? 
And, um, and so I, I drove to Beth's dad to ask for his consent. On the way home, I crashed a car, wrote off a car, not good. And, um, and then we had to drive to do marriage prep with uh, the, the kind of wonderful vicar in the country church where Beth's parents um, went to church. Um, and on the way there, um, we had probably the biggest argument we've ever had in our entire lives, actually. Um, it was so bad that by the time we drove into the drive of this house to start our marriage prep, um, we weren't speaking to each other. And, um, and, we kind of, and he, he was kind of a nice guy, quite old, and um, he, he went high and he sat us down in this little room and started this kind of hour-long session to take us through marriage preparation. And he realized quite quickly, he said, I feel like there's an elephant in the room. And, uh, and we were like, yeah, there is an elephant in the room. And he said, oh, um, have you guys had an argument? And we're like, yes, we've had an argument. And um, Beth and I, you know, sometimes take a little bit of encouragement to come back from that position. And so he said, well, maybe it'd be good if all three of us talk about it now in this room. And we kind of looked at each other, we looked at him, and we said, no, we don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> and, uh, and he was like, oh, okay. Um, so then he had to try and give us marriage prep while the two of us weren't speaking to each other. Very difficult to do. And um, it was probably the most awkward 45 minutes of our lives as he tried to kind of say, well, you know, in marriages, communication is important. And we're like, <laughs> and, um, you know, it's really important to kind of, you know, not to go to sleep when you're upset with each other. And it just went on and on. And I think afterwards he said, well, I think, I think we're done now and um, see you in a month, you know. <laughs> and as we drove out from his house, I remember thinking, he must think we're doomed. He must think we're absolutely doomed. Like there's no hope for this relationship these guys can't even do, can't even speak to each other during marriage prep. And, it, you know, we, it was just a bit of a rocky start to our engagement. Um, and we didn't really know what we were doing. And it, you could have looked at us and said, well, that's not very promising. But by God's grace, our roots went deep. And so, you know, 18 years later, I'm very happy to say that I'm more in love with my wife, Beth, than ever. Um, but invest in what is unseen. It doesn't matter if you've made a mistake. Maybe you came to faith just a few months ago or a few years ago. Maybe it was a long time ago and you've had a rocky season and you've had a bit of a storm and it feels like things haven't come to the place you thought they might have by now. It's not too late. Invest in your roots today. You know, read God's word. Ask God to speak to you through it. We're starting an Advent devotional for families um, in, in just a couple of weeks. A great time to read God's word together each night as a family or each morning. Uh, you know, we, I'd encourage you, maybe there's a, a way try, you can try reading the Bible each day. I remember once I was speaking at a, at a thing and I, I challenged people and I said, look, you know, at the moment we've got um, uh, five weeks until Christmas. If you can read the Bible and ask God to speak to you, pray just a bit of the Bible, maybe read a chapter of a gospel each day for the next five weeks. Just ask God to speak to you through it. I promise you, by Christmas, your life will feel in a very different place. It will be transformed. I once did this before and um, I said, if you read the Bible every day for five weeks, uh, I promise you your life will be transformed. This guy wrote me an email on Christmas Eve. He said, um, he said, Stephen, I took up your challenge. I've read the Bible every day from five weeks ago to now. He said, um, I, I think, I think you, weren't, you weren't actually right when you said my life would be transformed. He said, it's true. I do feel much greater peace. I feel more purpose in my life. Um, my relationships have improved. I feel closer to God than ever before. Um, I feel more energy in my day. And I feel like God is speaking to me on a daily basis. But I can't honestly say my life has been transformed. Um, <laughs> Kind regards. And I was like, really? <laughs> Sounds pretty good to me. Why don't you give that a go? Invest in your roots. Grow deep roots. And then be wholehearted. And the first time I heard this passage read, I thought, ah, oh, this is a great passage for me. This is a passage for people who aren't yet Christians or who have just come to faith. I can just kick back. I can think about other things. It's not relevant to me. I don't have to worry about anything. You know, this is for other people. I can just switch off. And then I got a bit of a shock because Jesus talks about the seed that's sown and received into people's hearts and grows and has roots and yet it's been sown in amongst the weeds. And what happens is they grow faster. They block out the sun, they steal the water and they choke the plants and the seed is literally suffocated. 
And what Jesus says here is that the word of God is simply crowded out and it can't bear fruit. Jesus says it's choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures and does not mature. Mark says the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. I find this really uncomfortable to hear, like that Jesus' diagnosis of the human heart is like a laser in its accuracy. There's been times in my life where all three of these things have choked the word of God in my life. Times when it's been a really challenging season at work, and you're kind of waking up at two in the morning, and you're thinking, you know, I just, I'm not sure I can do this. Remember a few years ago, going through one of those seasons, and just thinking, I these worries are choking the word of God in my life. What do I do? And I'd say, well, turn your worries into prayer. I'd turn my worries into prayer, but then I'd just think about my worries more. I said, what do you do at 2 a.m.? And what all I could do was I thought, well, let's, let's use the word of God to target those worries. So I just found like a verse, like Psalm 3.3. You, O Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head high. And I just pray that prayer, that psalm, that verse. You, O Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head high. I just pray again and again and again and declare that truth. And then this peace would come over me and I'd get back to sleep. Or, you know, I, I, I'd, I'd be worried about something else and I'd just pray this. You know, Psalm 143, verse 8. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Then if you're struggling in the day, show me the way I should go. For to you, I entrust my life. Target your worries with his words. Sometimes all you've got to go on when you're in a difficult season is the truth and the power in his word. But I tell you, I'd rather rely on one word from his lips than a thousand words from other people. Grab hold of his word and rub it into your heart. There's times when I've found wealth to be really deceitful. You know, sometimes it deceives you because you can think, if I could just get enough, then I'd be happy. Like if I could just earn an extra X or an extra Y, then I, I, I'd have no worries, I'd have complete fulfillment, I'd have unending happiness. But it's not true. I remember speaking to a colleague once, and he was really stressed. He said, Steve, I just don't have enough money to live on. Finding life really difficult, there's so many pressures. I said, I'm so sorry to hear that. He said, yeah. He said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm scarcely earning 300,000 pounds a year. I don't know what to do. I said, that's a lot of money. I said, yeah, but it's not enough. If I could just earn six or seven or eight, then I'd be fine. But then you speak to someone else, they're earning six or seven or eight, they're like, I'm not earning enough money. You know, wealth deceives you. And sometimes it deceives you because when you are wealthy, I found it, it kind of encourages me to put all my trust in my money. I started to look to money to solve all my problems. I'd, I'd realized that it shaped the way I even approached difficulties. Now, before I even prayed about a problem, I was thinking, how can I help my money to fix this issue? And it stopped me bearing fruit. But then as I started to give it away, investing in the church, being generous, I found that I was more content with what I had left and then desires for other things. I don't know what it is for you, but success or prestige or status or comfort, they kind of crowd in and they become more important than seeing God's word bear fruit in my life. You see, if you have a divided heart, you'll be easily distracted. Um, and, and there are things we all suffer with, but the antidote is to make that decision. I'm going to go after Jesus with my whole heart. Because Jesus doesn't just promise that he'll help you forget your troubles. He gives you deep peace in the midst of your troubles. Jesus doesn't just promise you know, mere wealth. He gives you the promise of true riches, life in all its fullness. Jesus doesn't just promise temporary fulfillment or fleeting status. But he tells you that the truth that all your deepest desires can be fulfilled in him. Give him your focus, your attention. And we all need help to do this. We can't do it on our own. You know, who weeds the soil? Certainly not the soil, certainly not the seed. It's the sower. He's the one who's willing to help you. And the potential is huge. What I find fascinating about this passage is that each seed carries in it the potential for growth and multiplication. Like one seed. I love this. It's, Jesus tells this story about the sower. Who sows seed? Jesus sows the word of God. 
He's happy that three and four seeds that he sows are not going to bear fruit. He's not happy, but he just knows that's life. But 25% of them are going to bear exponential fruit. Going to bear exponential return, 10,000%. So 100 seed, 75 of them might not bear fruit. 25 of them bear 2,500. Each seed has extraordinary potential within it because when the seed is received and takes root and is not crowded out by weeds, it will bear a crop, a hundred times what it's saying. Not just double or triple, but a hundred times. And just imagine through your life what is possible. How the word of God bearing fruit within you might transform the lives of colleagues and friends and families and neighbors as the word of God bears much fruit and multiplies you. And we can be part of this, sowing the seed into other people's lives. And it's happening even now. Last week at our 6 p.m. service, so moving, lots of people came to faith. I spoke to the first one, and, and friends had brought him to church for the first time in his life. And a young guy in his 20s. So interesting. And then, and then I spoke to the second one, and her friend had brought her to church for the first time that day. Just said, look, why don't you just come along? She was like, I'm really excited about this now. What do I do next? Third person I spoke to, he was at work at 5 p.m., just finishing his shift. And one of his colleagues said to him, look, you've never come to church with me. Why don't you come to church now? So they came to church together. He heard the word. And he decided he wanted to place his trust in Jesus. Like each you know, not every seed you sow might bear fruit, but you can trust that God isn't going to let those seeds just lie dormant. And some of those seeds are going to bear fruit through people's lives, across people's lives. You're going to start chain reactions as the seed grows in your life and grows in other people's lives. And they sow that seed into other people's lives. Chain reactions across the generation and through the generations. You know, people you might never meet this side of eternity who say to you, you know, you sowed a seed not knowing what impact it would have. And that person, this happened in that person's life. You weren't even really aware of it. And then this happened in that person's life. And then they sowed a seed in this person's life. And then this whole family came to faith. And actually, I'm one of that family. You don't know the impact of the seeds that you sow. What you can know is that Jesus is just as interested today as when he said these words 2,000 years ago, at the seed bearing fruit. Jesus came to seek and save the lost, and he's still just as interested in that, and he hasn't lost any of his power, any of his potential, any of his passion. He wants to see the seed that he is sowing in this city, in your lives, bear much fruit. And he's going to go ahead of you into your workplaces, into your schools, in your hospitals. He's going to prepare the ground, soften people's hearts, clear out some of the weeds, find good soil. Just think what is possible as you sow those seeds. Let's stand and we're going to pray. I just encourage you, if you're happy, just to hold out your hands as a sign you'd like to receive something from God today. Maybe you want to close your eyes and fix your thoughts on Jesus. And Lord, we know you're here by your spirit. And we know your word is at work in our lives. And so we ask today, Holy Spirit, would you water our hearts? Would you clear out any rocks? Would you clear out any weeds? Would you come, Holy Spirit? We long to bear much fruit for you. Come, Holy Spirit. And just be open in this moment to what the Holy Spirit might want to whisper to you. Maybe it's something about where your heart might have got hard. Just asking the Holy Spirit to soften your heart today. Maybe it's a new habit you want to try and form to deepen your roots. Maybe you want to ask God's help just to clear out some of those weeds. 
maybe it's boldness um, to sow those seeds this week. Come, Holy Spirit.